Christian. I believed Jesus was God. I believed in the Trinity, the Incarnation, the Atonement. I believed in the inerrancy of Scripture. I was an evangelical, of course, Protestant, uh, conservative. And on the other hand, I was becoming aware through my own innocent reading of the New Testament particularly, of various big problems, which as I say, I thought were spiritually, um, a spiritual in origin caused by the devil trying to undermine my faith. I don't believe that anymore, of course, because these problems I was stumbling across are well known to biblical scholars and Trinity and Atonement, which I can no longer accept for historical and philosophical and theological reasons. So what were some of the issues? Well, I stumbled across much to my horror in a way uh, through my reading. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala israbbil anbiya iwal salin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'du Puji syukur kehadirat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Kerana kita diberikan waktu dan kesempatan Berjumpa kembali melalui channel Salam Satu Akidah Semoga kita semua dirahmati Allah Dan diberi kekuatan serta keteguhan hati Di dalam iman Islam tentunya untuk terus menyuarakan kebenaran Islam serta memetik umat dari upaya pemurtadan. Baiklah saudara aku semuanya, pada kesempatan kali ini saya akan menampilkan sebuah video yang saya ambil dari channelnya Indonesiana TV. Kita dukung channelnya ya. Dan video tersebut berisikan tentang seorang pakar Al Alkitab atau Bibel dunia. <coughs> yang keluar dari uh, Kristen setelah uh, mempelajari, meneliti, menganalisa uh, Bibel uh, sehingga dia menemukan banyak kesalahan di dalam Bibel itu sendiri. Nah, di dalam uh, negeri sendiri di Indonesia uh, kaum kadal ini uh, dengan susah payah ya untuk uh, membenarkan. Uh, kitab mereka dengan berbagai cara sementara di luar sana orang-orang yang mau uh, berfikir menggunakan akalnya uh, tidak saja menggunakan uh, kecerdasan intelektual ya tetapi juga harus menggunakan kecerdasan spiritual dan juga kecerdasan hati karena untuk mencari kebenaran menggali kebenaran suatu agama tentu kita harus uh, menggunakan akal dan rasa Nah, tanpa kedua unsur ini, maka kita akan selalu uh, tertipu dan tidak akan mau tahu uh, mencari atau menggali kebenaran itu sendiri. Nah, jadi inilah contoh-contoh orang yang mau berpikir dan juga mempunyai uh, pemikiran yang kritis ya terhadap uh, sesuatu, uh, yaitu kitab Bibel itu sendiri. Dan Al-Quran pun sebenarnya bisa <coughs> Memang harus uh, diuji siapapun silakan menguji dan membuktikan Menggali uh, kebenaran Al-Quran tersebut Itu karena memang Al-Quran adalah untuk seluruh manusia ya. Jadi siapa saja boleh membaca, mempelajari, meneliti me, me, uh, Nelaahnya uh, sesuai dengan di, disiplin ilmu masing-masing uh, orang ya dan itu untuk membuktikan apakah uh, kitab uh, suci tersebut benar datangnya dari Allah apa tidak maka kitab suci tersebut harus uh, tahan uji ya nah jika tidak uh, tahan uji maka itu bukanlah uh, berasal dari Tuhan ya nah seperti yang ditemukan oleh pakar uh, dunia ini tentang Bibel dan bagaimana keterangannya uh, selengkapnya uh, nanti kita akan uh, dengarkan dan saksikan bersama ya namun terlebih dahulu saya mengucapkan terima kasih yang sedih tingginya kepada saudaraku semua yang sudah mendukung channel ini juga yang baru subscribe jangan lupa untuk subscribe dan share ya 
juga kita dukung channel-channel dakwah lainnya untuk terus uh, berkembang guna menyuarakan kebenaran Islam serta untuk memetengi umat dari upaya pemurtadan. Nah, tanpa panjang muka dimah lagi, langsung saja kita simak videonya. Selamat menyaksikan. Bahan buku salinan dan ada lebih dari 5000 bahkan ada yang mengatakan lebih dari 10.000 salinan Bible. Dan lucunya tidak ada satupun dari salinan itu yang sama ayat-ayatnya. Para sobat, video ini bersumber dari blogging teologi dan diterjemahkan dengan cantik oleh juru kunci masjid. Paul William pakar Bible tingkat internasional saja keluar dari Kristen. Jadi kalau ada umat Paulus Indonesia yang masih ngotot tentang kebenaran Bible, admin hanya ketawa saja. But it wasn't as simple as that. Yes, some of the problems did have solutions and I happily moved on, but others of them I kind of dug myself into a deeper and deeper hole. And um, I discovered other problems because scholars would reference other issues and I think, oh my goodness me, I didn't know that was a problem. And that became an issue for me. Um, and as I said, I developed this parallel existence. On the one hand, I was a committed Christian. I believed Jesus was God. I believed in the Trinity, the incarnation, the atonement. I believed in the inerrancy of scripture. I was an evangelical, of course, Protestant, uh, conservative. And on the other hand, I was becoming aware through my own innocent reading of the New Testament, particularly of various big problems, which, as I say, I thought were spiritually, um, a spiritual in origin caused by the devil trying to undermine my faith. I don't believe that anymore, of course, because these problems I was stumbling across are well known to biblical scholars and have been discussed by them for the last 150, 200 years. I just stumbled across issues which were well known in the world of biblical studies. Um, and of course, unless there's some kind of massive satanic conspiracy, you know, in all the universities and seminaries in the world, um, you know, this is, these are real issues. And I think, of course, they are real issues. Um, what are they? Well, there's a number of them. Uh, I'll just give you a, a couple of uh, examples. And then I'm going to read from a, a book by a leading um, Church of England priest, a biblical scholar and dean of King's College here in London, professor of biblical interpretation, a very respected um, scholar. Um, and he discusses uh, some of these issues in a very concise and helpful way just to share with you uh, what happened to me uh, what, when I also wrestled with these issues. And it led me ultimately to part company with many, not all, many of the fundamental teachings of Christianity, because I still believe a lot of Christianity is true. Um, uh, obviously, a belief in one God, belief in uh, the creation, the created order, that Jesus was the Messiah sent by God, the prophets, I believe, the day of judgment, I believe in angels and demons and, and the resurrection of the dead. And so the list is very long, actually. It's like a huge iceberg under the water. There's so much I still just accept as there. It's just a little bit on top, principally to do with things like incarnation, trinity and atonement, which I can no longer accept for historical and philosophical and theological reasons. So what were some of the issues? Well, I stumbled across, much to my horror in a way, uh, through my reading of the New Testament, the clear impression that many people, including Jesus, including Paul, James, John and others, expected the end of the world soon, very soon, imminently, within the lifetime of people then living. And um, I looked into this and tried to find a way to uh, reconcile this with the rather obvious fact that we are living 2,000 years later and the end hasn't come anytime soon. And there's a prospect of endless millennia ahead. How can this be the case? There seems to be a mistake here made by Jesus and Paul and James and John, etc. Um, and the more I looked into this problem, it's called, uh, technically it's called eschatology uh, or the imminent parousia, the more I realized 
that in fact there was a mistake, at least according to the scriptures uh, of the New Testament, that uh, uh, the way they spoke, Jesus is made to have made a mistake and Paul clearly makes a mistake. Now, these are not uh, moral errors. They're not bad people because they made a mistake. Paul expected the end of the world. You know, he was wrong. He is a human being. He was wrong about many things, in fact. Um, so that was one uh, serious issue. The other serious issue, which is kind of connected, is uh, the Gospels. Um, I discovered, and this is something that I didn't stumble across in my reading of the New Testament, but I learned and discovered through reading scholarship, biblical scholars. I discovered that the, the Gospel of John is seen as much less historical than the other three Gospels. And that's a real shame because the Gospel of John has some of the juiciest, most robust, most clear statements of Jesus' divinity anywhere in the New Testament, where Jesus says, according to John, I am the light of the world, or before Abraham was, I am, or I am the resurrection and the life, etc., etc. Now, all of these wonderful statements are only found in one Gospel, the very last to be written. They're not found anywhere else. And um, scholars are pretty unanimous with one or two exceptions across the whole world, the leading scholars, including Christian, most, most scholars are Christians, that Jesus, the actual historical Jesus 2,000 years ago, didn't say these things. And the reasons why are historical and, and textual and theological. I'm not going to go into them, but the fact is that is the case. And I was shocked to discover that was the case. Now, what did that mean to me? It meant that I, I felt that I could no longer rely on John, the Gospel of John, to give me the teaching of Jesus, the true historical, as it happened, as it really happened, teaching of Jesus. I felt that the experts, the historians, as I say, vast majority of whom are Christians, had taken the Gospel away from me and I could no longer rely on it as reliable, as authentic. So that was... Uh, that was unfortunate. Um, now, there are other issues. I'm not going to go into them. But what they did was they, uh, the, 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 uh, the edifice of my Christian faith began to crack. And uh, the foundation, you know, basically started to crumble. Um, and my faith started to fall over. Uh, now, this is at the same time, of course, as a, being a believing Christian and believing all these doctrines of the inerrancy of Scripture, the deity of Christ, the atonement, the incarnation, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and all that. Perfection of the Bible. And I was discovering the Bible was very imperfect, that it contained errors. And in fact, some of the things I took as history and as true were perhaps not really history or true, at least in terms of something that could be traced back to Jesus. So um, I became increasingly schizophrenic, if that's the right word. On the one hand, I was a went to church i believed i prayed on the other hand my faith was in crisis and it wasn't getting any better it was getting worse and worse and worse and i did study uh this at university uh as well and uh which didn't um help in some ways my faith my conservative faith but that's another story i'm not going to go into that so just want to share with you um some words from uh this book jesus now and then by Richard A. Burridge and Graham Gould. Now, Richard Burridge, uh, as I say, is Dean of King's College, one of the great theological colleges in Britain. Uh, he's professor of biblical interpretation. He's um, also a Church of England priest. He's a believing Christian. Uh, and he wrote this book with Gould, who is um, a lecturer also at King's College in Patristics, that is the early fathers. So they co-wrote this book. And I do recommend it, actually. You can get it uh, via Amazon and so on. And um, this is what they say. Um, and I have no reason to disagree with this. Uh, I, but I want to share with you, give you a flavour of how serious Christian committed top-notch biblical scholars and experts understand the historical basis for their Christian faith and the problems they see. They see this uh, and... and uh, you know, these are not enemies of Christianity. So, uh, this is page 195. They write, To modern eyes, it is almost in inevitable that theologians, that the theologians of the early church, will appear to have read scripture in a very naive way, 
when they took it as evidence that Jesus was a divine person, become human, in other words, the incarnation, they took what to us seem like very vague hints in the Old Testament about the figure of the Messiah or the figure of wisdom, a personified quality of God in the Old Testament, notably the book of Proverbs, and interpreted these as evidence that the Old Testament authors actually foresaw in considerable detail the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. So what they're saying here is that these early theologians of the church and the bishops, uh, you know, whether it be Origen or Irenaeus or Tertullian or Justin Martyr, uh, quite, quite a few of these very well-known names, they mined the Old Testament for um, hints or evidence or proofs about the coming of Jesus, God on earth, the Messiah, the Incarnation. Um, and alongside this prophetic proof of Jesus' status as God's Son or Messiah, which is expanded, he says, for example, in the works of Justin and Origen, the Church Fathers set a range of information about him, his miracles, his teaching, his authority over demons and his power to forgive sins and erected it into what to them was very clear proof that he was a divine being. Even then they were not finished, for they took the New Testament hints about Jesus' pre-existence, for example in Colossians, Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verse 15, and the Gospel of John, 1, 1, and developed them with the aid of the Logos doctrine of, of Middle Platonist philosophy, into the fully-fledged doctrine of Jesus as God's creative Logos, which in the second century became the basis of the doctrines of the Trinity and Incarnation. Now this is heavy historical theology, I'm not necessarily going to unpack it all here. It needs to say that the doctrine of the Trinity did not exist in the first century or the second century. Uh, what, was, what predominated, I remember studying this at university, was this Logos theology in the second century. Logos is the Greek word meaning word or reason, and it was identified as Jesus. This doctrine is heavily influenced by pagan philosophy, i.e. Plato's ideas, the, the Greek philosopher from the 5th century BC. They continue, modern readers of the Bible know much more than the writers of the early church could possibly have done about the type of literature that is contained in the Bible, about the nature of metaphor, about the way in which beliefs about the Messiah accumulated and the way in which Christian beliefs about Jesus developed over time, including the period of the New Testament itself. So they're saying here that today, because of our awareness and sensitivity of genre, that's the sense of the different kinds of literature that exists. So we have to ask what kind of literature is this? Is it poetry? Is it a metaphor? Is it history? Is it a letter? Is it meant to be taken as uh, unvarnished reporting or is it highly interpreted? And so on and so on. We're now much more sensitive to these issues, they say, than the early fathers were. And also the sense that the understanding of Jesus in the early church developed and changed. It wasn't static from the beginning. So they continue, we are aware of how the New Testament presentation of Jesus was shaped by beliefs about him so that it cannot be used as a purely objective historical evidence for his life and status. So they're saying here, this is a commonplace in scholarship, that the beliefs of the writers, say of the Gospels, the beliefs that they had, shaped the way they spoke about Jesus. So the Gospels tell us as much really about the author's beliefs about Jesus as they do about Jesus out there as a person who they are describing. So they're not objective in the modern sense of being disinterested uh, accounts of a life. They are motivated by faith. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but we need to be aware of that when we read these texts and not just assume, perhaps naively, that they are giving us objective truth. So they continue and they give an example. For example, we know that some of the gospel statements that Jesus fulfilled prophecy and the events in his life that are alleged to have done so were probably created in the light of the belief that he was the Messiah 
and cannot be used as evidence to support the belief. For example, their example is the story of Jesus' flight into Egypt in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 to 15. Now, without going into all of what they're getting at here, uh, I'll just very briefly mention for Matthew, it is commonly accepted, is presenting Jesus as a new Moses, as a second Moses. And so the gospel portrays Jesus in that way. So, uh, of course, who was it that gave a sermon uh, uh, that, that addressed Israel on Mount Sinai? Well, it was Moses. Who was it that addressed the crowds on the Sermon on the Mount? Well, it was the second Moses, Jesus. Who was it that went, uh, uh, who came out of Egypt uh, in the Exodus? That was Moses. Who came out of Egypt? It was Jesus. And there's so many parallels between Moses and Jesus and Moses and Jesus, which are uniquely found in this gospel. No other gospel, Luke, for example, does not have uh, Jesus going off to Egypt. Um, and this is, a, this he, he says, uh, these um, stories, well, the story of Jesus' flight into Egypt and then out of Egypt, again, uh, are probably created, they say, in the light of the belief that he was the Messiah and, but they don't say it, but a second Moses. So, they continue, unless modern Christians are going to, to pretend that they live in the second or fourth century and to take scripture exactly as it was taken by the tradition prior to the Enlightenment, it is difficult to accept that there is as much historical basis in scripture for believing that Jesus was divine as the early church commonly thought. For this reason alone, the liberal project of refusing to be too dogmatic about claiming that Jesus was divine seems amply justified. Now this extract is part of a, a chapter which is talking about modern understandings of Jesus and it's talking about how the liberal understanding of Jesus actually can help us to uh, sort out fact from fiction in the Gospels. Um, so I, I'll leave that there but you, you see how how dangerous this is if you are a fundamentalist Christian because it really brings you up against the question of the historical uh, or unhistorical nature of the Gospels in the light of an intelligent critical understanding of the texts and that's just the tip of the iceberg so just to end it really here because I could go on and on and on for hours like this um, a lot of what I believe as a Christian I still believe uh, as I said the iceberg is there vast areas of belief I still hold. In fact, most of what I believe, I still believe. But on certain crucial doctrines, crucial beliefs, I don't. I don't believe Jesus was Yahweh. Um, I don't believe it, that he was the incarnate Son of God. I don't believe he was the second person of the Trinity. And, I, and the idea of atonement, this idea of a human sacrifice or, or of, of any kind, is necessary for God to forgive us and reconcile us, I think is totally unacceptable uh, on historical and moral and theological grounds so I reject that now uh, and I have obviously for some time so that's why I'm no longer a Christian but I suppose you could say I'm still half a Christian and I, I, what I mean by that is I, I the good things in Christianity I accept the things I no longer believe in I don't accept obviously um, so that's for what it's worth my story and I must say that there are many many people who can give a similar story uh, I, I know that the people who were with me in the first year class at university when I started to study Christianity, a Bachelor of Divinity degree at uh, University of London, I think most of us were conservative Christians, evangelicals, probably more and more Catholics as well. And I believe, I'm told, uh, that by the end of the course, uh, only one person was still evangelical or traditional at all and even they were quite liberal because we'd all been forced to face the facts the historical facts the literary facts the archaeology uh the facts uh, of uh of biblical scholarship what they have uncovered and shown us uh, about the scriptures and about historical theology about the historical jesus about well you name it it's a very long list and um that's why um Many of us, well, some of us lost our faith. Some of us clung to bits of it. Um, anyway, but so there we go. That's why. I'm... Nah, saudaraku semuanya, kita sudah dengarkan ya uh, kesaksian dari seorang pakar atau ahli Bibel, Powell William ya, yang lulusan Uni Universitas London. Uh, 
Uh, kenapa dia keluar dari Kristen? Uh, karena itu setelah melakukan penelitian, melakukan kajian terhadap Bibel itu sendiri dan dia menyimpulkan bahwa uh, penulis perjanjian lama itu meramalkan dengan baik dan rinci tentang kehidupan, kematian dan kebangkitan Yesus. Nah yang paling menonjol katanya adalah uh, teologi logos atau adalah kata Yunani ya yang berarti kata atau alasan dan itu diidentifikasi sebagai Yesus. Nah, doktrin ini sangat dipengaruhi oleh filosofi pagan ya, terutama uh, pemikir uh, pemikiran dari seorang filsuf Yunani yaitu Plato. Kemudian uh, Bapak ini juga sudah tidak mempercayai bahwa Yesus itu adalah uh, Yahweh atau juga sebagai anak Tuhan uh, dan itu berdasarkan uh, teori uh, moral dan juga teologis jadi uh, kesimpulannya uh, memang Bapak ini uh, sebagian isi Bibel itu sangat uh, banyak yang tidak dia percaya lagi dan memang ada sebagian kecil masih dia percayai. Jadi mudah-mudahan video ini bisa mengurangi ya atau bisa merefleksi urat-urat uh, leher yang sudah tegang-tegang dari kaum kadal yang selama ini selalu ingin uh, memaksakan uh, Yesus sebagai Tuhan. Dan mudah-mudahan setelah melihat video ini urat-urat lehernya yang tegang bisa kendor ya. Nah demikianlah saudara aku semuanya Mudah-mudahan juga ini bermanfaat Bagi kita menambah ilmu pengetahuan Dan wawasan uh, Akhir kalam Tidak tidak ada gading yang tidak retak Kalau ada salah itu murni dari saya Kebenaran hakiki hanya milik Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Terima kasih Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh